Okay, class, hey, welcome. All right, so we're going to try this new online uh, lecture. Um, if I'm going too fast, remember, just press pause. Um, hopefully, we're all going to make it through the coronavirus, and uh, hopefully, all grades are going to do great. Be on the lookout for assignments, um, and also make sure to uh, give you the heads up on those. All right, so this is the Good Times, Bad Times, 1920 to 1932 lecture, where we start talking about getting into the Depression. Now, guys, this is all about the politics of prosperity. We had new needs like highways, prohibition, immigration. We had new choices like evolution. What are we going to do about low farm prices? What are we going to do about transportation? And we have new realities like the progressives are really, really losing in power and importance. Now, the first thing we'll examine is Harding's failed presidency. Uh, everything looked, he looked all the part of the president. He was handsome, outgoing, etc. However, he was most at home in cigar filled back rooms playing poker. They gave out hundreds of government jobs. And his administration is one of the most corrupt in American history. He died on August 2nd, 1923, when a blood vessel in his brain burst. And when this happens, all of a sudden, all the stuff he did starts to come out. Like you had the Teapot Dome scandal, where uh, interior, the in Interior Secretary Fall had accepted huge bribes for leasing out the, oil re the federal oil reserves at Teapot Dome, Wyoming. You had Attorney General Harry Doherty and others who had accepted bribes to approve the sale of government-held property for much less than its value. They also protected bootleggers. And the head of the Veterans Bureau had swindled the government out of more than $200 million. Three of his cabinet men go to jail. Five commit suicide. And in 1927, Harding's mistress published a tell-all book. Hey, going to the next slide. <clears throat> now we have a throughway election in 1924. Calvin Coolidge was the vice president who the Republicans picked. The Northern Democrats, they pick Al Smith, who was the son of immigrants, Catholic. He was the governor of New York. He had been very, very progressive and had done a lot of stuff for the city. But as you can guess, his whole immigrant uh, Catholic stuff scared the willies out of a lot of people. And the Southern Democrats, uh, they wanted to uh, get a uh, executive who had worked for the Teapot Dome Company. But instead they chose John W. Davis, who had served in Wilson's cabinet. And the progressive socialists, they choose Robert LaFoliette who uh, supported many of their platforms, and he was the first presidential candidate actually endorsed by the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. But LaFoliot's candidacy, as you can guess, scared Republicans uh, who claimed that the key issue of this election was if America would allow itself to be degraded into a communist or socialist state or whether it would remain American. Well, what happens when all the smoke clears? Well, basically, Coolidge won. Uh, he got 16 million votes, which was 54% of the vote. So what was Coolidge all about? 
Well, his election slogan was, keep it cool with cow. And basically, uh, Coolidge continued as before, very limited government. He announced that the business of America is business and believed that free market and free operation of business would sustain economic prosperity for all. Now that's kind of like what some of the modern day Republicans have done and what Texas government has done, uh, which might be really good for business, but as you can guess, it's not so great for farmers. All right, getting ready to go to the next slide. And uh, the McNary Hohen Bill, which would have given price supports and subsidies uh, for farmers, was reluctantly pushed through Congress, only to have Coolidge veto it. He got the wealthiest man in the nation, Andrew Mellon, to be his Secretary of the Treasury. He gave substantial cuts, tax cuts, to the wealthy and corporations. Even though Hoover warned Coolidge uh, to regulate the incredibly wild use of credit, uh, Coolidge pretty much refused. He put competent businessmen in government positions, stacked the courts with pro-business judges. Going on to the next slide. The Diplomacy of Prosperity. Okay. So guys, basically we had two realities to deal with. We had Wilson's international isolationism and quest for economic expansion. And while we refused to accept the Treaty of Versailles, we made separate peace treaties with the Central Powers. Oh, my little song song. Okay, here we go. Uh, basically, we had two realities to deal with. Wilson's international isolationism and quest for economic expansion where we don't want anything to do with the world but we want them to buy all our goods and while we refused to accept the Treaty of Versailles we made separate peace treaties with the Central Powers and unaffected by the war American companies continued to outproduce and outtrade the rest of the world Indeed, 30% of the world's total. American firms produce 70% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's coal and steel. So needless to say, we're doing very well. All right, getting ready to go on to the next slide. And as you can guess, American bankers loan billions of dollars to other nations. And even though our attempts to expand our economy in the Middle East and Asia were limited, other areas proved very fruitful. Okay, getting ready to go to the next slide. The United States and Latin America. The Monroe Doctrine, American investments, control of the Panama Canal, and our armed intervention made us very active in Latin America. But in 1921, when Harding entered office, we had troops in Panama, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. And although we promised to pull out the troops, he did so slowly, 
as he didn't want anti-American governments to seize control. To ensure this, he maintained control over the finances and installed American trained National Guards. All right, getting ready to go to the next slide. But we did do a series of pullouts. Indeed, uh, we're out of the Dominican Republic by 1924, out of Nicaragua by 1932, we're out of Haiti by 1934, and even though the Dominican Republic and Haiti, the U.S. continued to control their custom houses and import tax revenues until the 1940s, so the Europeans wouldn't get involved. Now, what do we do in this nation uh, when we leave? Well, basically, we leave an improved infrastructure, like better roads, sanitation systems, governments favorable to the U U.S. There's very little advances, however, in like their educational system, their national economies, or implementing a higher standard of living. Once again, why do we do that? Because that's their job, not our job. Kind of like your parents might pay for you to go to college, but it's up to you to get good grades. Now, of course, democracies that weren't supported, that didn't support stability, was preferable to freedom. For example, Rafael Trujillo, the Dominican Republican uh, dictator, remained in power until his death in 1961. And in Nicaragua, our troops sent in by Taft in 1916, left in 1925, only to have to come back in 1926 to protect the government after a civil war broke out. You had the Peace of Tiapas, which was signed in 1927, which ended most of the fighting, except the rebel forces led by Augusto Sandino, who fought on. And basically the president, Juan Bautista Asaka, uh, invited him to the National Palace for dinner. And at the dinner, basically, he's assassinated. And the rebels that used to follow Sandino become the Sandinistas. So even though the dictator was assassinated in 1956, his family remained in power until 1979 when the Sandinistas drove them out of Nicaragua. Okay, getting ready to go to the next slide. Now, uh, commercially, um, uh, under the United Fruit Company, we purchased hundreds of thousands of acres of land for plantations to grow bananas and other fruits. In Venezuela and Colombia, we held profitable drilling rights. Indeed, we also did in Mexico, but after the Mexican Revolution in 1917, Mexico moved to nationalize all the subsurface resources and utilize uh, a lot of people wanted to go in there and utilize military action to prevent the taking of uh, the oil. Coolidge instead sends Dwight D. Morrow to keep us out of war with Mexico and delay nationalization of existing oil companies until 1938. Ready for the next slide? 
American and the European community. Well, guys, since World War I was shattering the uh, established economies of Europe, uh, the U.S. is climbing to unprecedented economic heights, and we emerge as the world's leading creditor nation. After the war, we want to expand our exports and restrict our imports. So they passed the Fordney McCumber Tariff, which raised tariff levels to record heights on imported goods. While this might sound like it's a great deal, like we're buying less European goods, guys, it's depriving Europe of the money that it needs to pay back the loans that uh, they took out from us during the war. So as you can guess, this leads to a little difficulty. Ready for the next slide? Basically, England, France, and Italy asked for forgiveness from the war debts owned, uh, owed to the U.S. Coolidge responded, well, they hired the money, didn't they? In other words, hey, guys, you were all more than ready to accept it and demanded full repayment with interest. Now, if we're going to do this, guys, Germany was central to the plan. Because remember, they had to pay all the uh, Allied nations back for the total cost of the war. <clears throat> and um, indeed, if Germany recovered uh, economically and was able to pay the $33 billion in debt, uh, other Europe European nations would recover and pay back the debts. Now, just so you know, some American businessmen took advantage. Uh, what was going on in Europe? You had more than $4 billion in American business investment that flowed into Europe. Like GM purchased Opel, which was Germany's largest auto producer. Ford built the largest auto manufacturer outside of the U.S. in England and constructed a tractor factory for the USSR. Okay, getting ready to go to the next slide. Now, Germany, they have a totally new government. They were under the Kaiser. He fled and abdicated the throne. Now they have the Weimar Republic. And guys, uh, the Weimar Republic had terrible financial woes. I mean, you had to have a wheelbarrow full of cash just to buy a loaf of bread. Money was used as wallpaper because it was cheaper to use the money that you the currency than it was to go out and buy wallpaper because they were just printing out money like mad. Now they couldn't keep up their war repayments to France or Belgium in 1923. So France sends in troops to occupy a major industrial zone, the Ruhr Valley, until they got repayment. There's kind of a poster about it where you see the German guy going, hey, look, I don't have any money. Can't get blood from a stone. So, guys, this is causing a crisis. Next slide. And a Chicago banker by the name of Charles C. Dawes worked out what was known as the Dawes Plan where America would loan Germany $2.5 billion, where they would pay $2 billion of the war debts to the other European nations, and the European nations would then turn around and pay us $2.5 billion. Now, guys, even though it seems totally wackadoo, it actually worked fairly well until 1929, 
when the Depression ended nearly all of the loan payments. All right, getting ready for the next slide. <clears throat> 